In the 19th century, railroad conspiracies and predatory pricing had been enough to assure the oligarchs' monopoly. But by the time that the British Crown, the Dutch royal family, the Rothschilds, and the other European oligarchs began opening up the Middle East and the Far East to oil exploration in the early 20th century, the goal was no longer to maximize profits or control the oil industry. It was not even to control international diplomacy. It was to control and shape the world itself, its resources, its environment, and its people. In order to achieve this goal, the oligarchy would need a facelift. In the current age, with the Rockefeller name now more likely to be associated with Rockefeller Plaza or Rockefeller University than Standard Oil, it is difficult to understand just how hated John D. was in his own day. He was the head of the Standard Oil Hydra, an octopus strangling the world in his tentacles, a cutthroat gardener pruning the competitors from the flower of his oil monopoly. As one of the richest men the world had ever known, he was an easy target for the average working man's frustration and a magnet for the poor seeking help. He received on average 50 to 60,000 letters a month asking for help. Uh, dozens of people followed him in the street. Uh, literally, uh, crowds stood around uh, the Standard Oil offices uh, waiting for him to come out. You know, uh, little children, painfully thin, you know, uh, crying in the street and so on. Uh, Rockefeller felt overwhelmed. Besieged by the downtrodden, despised by the working man, hounded by Ida Tarbell and the muckraking press, John Dee had the mother of all PR problems. The answer was simple. Invent the PR industry. He hired Ivy Ledbetter Lee, a journalist-turned-communications expert who invented the modern public relations industry, to burnish the Rockefeller's tarnished image. It was Lee that suggested giving the family name to Rockefeller Center and filming John Dee handing out dimes in public. An early master of public relations, Lee used the media which the muckrakers had used to disgrace Rockefeller to turn him into a sympathetic figure. Ivy Lee recognized early the power of the new moving picture and used newsreels to show a remarkably benevolent Rockefeller. I am very grateful to you and to a host of people who are so kind and good to me all the time. Why? Because you're so good to everybody. Yes, you are. <laughs> As Ivy Lee began to kind of control his public uh, image, he became oddly a, a kind of American character. And people kind of warmed to him in a bizarre sort of way. It was like having Frankenstein on the loose walking around New York City or something like that with a cane and a long hat. Although this plane never takes off, this photo opportunity was presented as Senior's first flight. Perhaps Ivy Lee's most brilliant public relations move was the casting of Rockefeller as the man who gave out dimes. Don't you give a dime, Mr. Rockefeller. Oh. <laughs> give it a dime. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I consider and I myself... thank you for the ride. I consider myself more than amply paid. Bless you, bless you, yes. bless you. These PR stunts seem obvious and ham-handed by today's standards, but they were effective enough. To this day, people leave dimes on the stone marker at the base of the 70-foot Egyptian obelisk that towers over John Dee's final resting place in Cleveland's Lakeview Cemetery. But it was not stage-managed photo opportunities like these that transformed Rockefeller into a public hero. In order to win the public over, he was going to have to give them what they wanted. And what they wanted wasn't difficult to understand. Money. But just as his father, Devil Bill, had taught him to do in all his business dealings, Rockefeller made sure to get the better end of the bargain. He would donate his great wealth to the creation of public institutions, but those institutions would be used to bend society to his will. As every would-be ruler throughout history has realized, society has to be transformed from the ground up. Americans in the 19th century still prized education and intellectual pursuits, with the 1840 census finding unsurprisingly that the United States, 
a nation that had been mobilized by tracts like Thomas Paine's remarkably popular Common Sense, was a nation of readers with a remarkable 93% to 100% literacy rate. Before the first compulsory schooling laws in Massachusetts in 1852, education was private and decentralized, and as a result classical education, including study of Greek and Latin and a solid grounding in history and science, was widespread. But a nation of individuals who could think for themselves was anathema to the monopolists. The oligarchs needed a mass of obedient workers, an entire class of people whose intellect was developed just enough to prepare them for lives of drudgery in a factory. Into the midst stepped John D. Rockefeller with his first great act of public charity, the establishment of the University of Chicago. He was aided in this task by Frederick Taylor Gates, a Baptist minister that Rockefeller befriended in 1889 and who would go on to be John D.'s most trusted philanthropic advisor. Gates would go on to write a short tract, The Country School of Tomorrow, that laid out the Rockefeller plan for education. In our dream, we have limitless resources, and the people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hand. The present educational conventions fade from our minds, and, unhampered by tradition, we work our own goodwill upon a grateful and responsive folk. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers or men of learning or science. We are not to raise up from among them authors, orators, poets, or men of letters. We shall not search for embryo great artists, painters, musicians. Nor will we cherish even the humbler ambition to raise up from among them lawyers, doctors, preachers, politicians, statesmen, of whom we now have ample supply. Although Rockefeller's resources weren't exactly limitless, they might as well have been. In 1902, he established the General Education Board to help implement Gates's vision for the country school of tomorrow with a staggering $180 million endowment. The Rockefeller influence on education was felt almost immediately, and it was amplified by help from fellow monopolists of the era who were approaching the topic of philanthropy from the same angle. Although best known as a steel magnate, Andrew Carnegie's fortune started on the railroads transporting Rockefeller's Standard Oil around the country, and was greatly magnified by a lucrative investment in property near Oil Creek that provided steady, profitable oil sales. In 1905, he established the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, a tax-free foundation through which Carnegie and his appointees could direct the development of the education system in the United States, and, eventually, worldwide. In 1910, Rockefeller followed suit by establishing the Rockefeller Foundation, which became the tax-free umbrella organization for his philanthropic ambitions. As the Reese Committee, a congressional investigation into the activities of these tax-free foundations in the 1950s discovered, it wasn't long before Carnegie's endowment approached Rockefeller's foundation with a proposal to cooperate on their shared desire to transform the American education system in their own image. Norman Dodd, the director of research for the Congressional Committee who was granted access to the Carnegie Endowment's board minutes, explains. So they approach the Rockefeller Foundation with the suggestion that that portion of education which is, could be considered domestic be handled by the Rockefeller Foundation and that portion which is international should be handled by the endowment. And they then decide that the key to the success of these two operations lay in the, an alteration of the teaching of American history. So they approach four of the then most prominent teachers of American history in the country, people like Charles and Mary Byrd, and their suggestion to them is will they alter the manner in which they present this subject and they get turned down flat. So they then decide that it is necessary for them to do, as they say, build our own stable of historians. And, if, and then they approach the Guggenheim Foundation, which specializes in fellowships, and say, when we find young men in the process of studying for doctorates in the field of American history, and we feel that they are uh, the right caliber, will you grant them fellowships on our say-so? And the answer is yes. 
So under that condition, eventually they assemble 20. And they take this 20 potential teachers of American history to London, and there they're briefed into what is expected of them, when as and if they secure appointments in keeping with the doctorates they will have earned. And um, that, new, that group of 20 historians ultimately becomes the nucleus of the American Historical Association. And then toward the end of the 1920s, the endowment grants to the American Historical Association $400,000 for a study of our history in a manner which points to what can this country be, can it look forward to in the future. And uh, that culminates in a seven volume study, book study, the last volume of which is, of course, in essence, a summary of the contents of the other six. And the essence of the last volume is the future of this country belongs to collectivism administered with characteristic American efficiency. With this base for transformation firmly established, the Rockefeller Foundation and like-minded organizations embarked on a program so ambitious that it almost defies comprehension. They transformed the practice of medicine. As usual, the oligarchs that funded this change were also there to profit from it, and once again, John D. took his cue from Devil Bill's example. William Rockefeller had called his brand of snake oil New Joel for New Oil, and Standard Oil spun off New Joel as a laxative under their Stanco subsidiary. Manufactured on the same premises as Flit, an insecticide also derived from Standard Oil's byproducts, New Joel sold at the druggist for 28 cents per 6-ounce bottle. It cost Standard Oil less than one-fifth of a cent to manufacture. Pharmaceuticals provided a lucrative new opportunity for the oligarchs, but in a turn-of-the-century America that was still largely based on naturopathic herbal remedies, it was a tough sell. The oligarchy went to work changing that. In 1901, John D. established the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research. The institute recruited Simon Flexner, a pathology professor at the University of Pennsylvania, to serve as its director. His brother, Abraham, was an educator who was contracted by the Carnegie Foundation to write a report on the state of the American medical education system. His study, the Flexner Report, along with the hundreds of millions of dollars that the Rockefeller and Carnegie Foundations were to shower on medical research in the coming years, resulted in a sweeping overhaul of the American medical system. Naturopathic and homeopathic medicine, medical care focused on the unpatentable, unmarketable natural remedies and cures, was now dismissed as quackery. Only drug-based allopathic medicine requiring expensive medical procedures and lengthy hospital stays was to be taken seriously. The fortunes of Carnegie, Morgan, and Rockefeller financed surgery, radiation, and synthetic drugs. They were to become the economic foundations of the new medical economy. The takeover of the medical industry was accomplished by the takeover of the medical schools. Well, the people that we're talking about, Rockefeller and Carnegie in particular, came to the picture and said, we will put up money. They offered tremendous amounts of money to the schools that would agree to cooperate with them. The donors said to the schools, we're, we're giving you all this money. Now, would it be too much to ask if we could put some of our people on your board of directors to see that our money is being spent wisely? Almost overnight, all of the major universities received large grants from these sources and also accepted one, two, or three of these people that I mentioned on their board of directors and the schools literally were taken over by the financial interests that put up the money. Now what happened as a result of that is that the schools did receive 
an infusion of money. They were able to build new buildings. They were able to add expensive equipment to their laboratories. They were able to hire top-notch teachers. But at the same time as doing that, they skewed the whole thing in the direction of pharmaceutical drugs. That was the efficiency in philanthropy. The doctors from that point forward in history would be taught pharmaceutical drugs. All of the great teaching institutions in America were captured by the pharmaceutical interests in this fashion. And it's amazing how little money it really took to do it. The oligarchy birthed entire medical industries from their own research centers and then sold their own products from their own petrochemical companies as the cure. It was Frank Howard, a Standard Oil of New Jersey executive, who would go on to persuade Alfred Sloan and Charles Kettering to donate their fortunes to the cancer center that would then bear their name. As director of research at Sloan Kettering, Howard appointed Cornelius Rhodes, a Rockefeller Institute pathologist, to develop his wartime research on mustard gas for the U.S. Army into a new cancer therapy. Under Rhodes' leadership, nearly the entire program and staff of the Chemical War Service was reformed into the Sloan Kettering Drug Development Program, where they worked on converting mustard gas into chemotherapy. And once again, the Rockefeller's own snake oil was being sold as a cancer cure-all. The oligarch's interest in the burgeoning pharmaceutical industry converged in companies like IG Farben, a drug and chemical cartel formed in Germany in the early 20th century. Royal Dutch's own Prince Bernhard served on an IG Farben subsidiary's board in the 1930s, and the cartel's American operation, set up in cooperation with Standard Oil, included on its board Standard Oil President Walter Teagle, as well as Paul Warburg of Kuhn Loeb and Company, itself headed by Jacob Schiff of the Rothschild Broker family. At its height, IG Farben was the largest chemical company in the world, and the fourth largest industrial concern in the world, right behind Standard Oil of New Jersey. The company was broken up after World War II, but like Standard Oil, its various pieces remained intact, and today BASF, one of its chemical offshoots, remains the largest chemical company in the world, while Bayer and Sanofi, two of its pharmaceutical offshoots, are among the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. Not content merely to monopolize the fields of education and medicine, the same oligarchical interests banded together to take control of America's finances. In 1910, John D. Rockefeller Jr.'s own father-in-law, Senator Nelson Aldrich, Frank Vanderlip of the National City Bank, and Paul Warburg, as well as various agents of J.P. Morgan, met in complete secrecy on Jekyll Island to hammer out the details of what would go on to become the Federal Reserve, America's central bank. The Fed, established in 1913, would be run by hand-picked appointees of the oligarchy and their banking associates, including, perhaps inevitably, Standard Oil President and American IG Director Walter Teagle. The Rockefeller family would go on to formally enter the banking field in the 1950s when James Stillman Rockefeller, the grandson of John D.'s brother, was appointed director of National City Bank. Meanwhile, John D.'s own grandson, David Rockefeller, would go on to take over Chase Manhattan Bank, the longtime banking partner of the Standard Oil Empire. In this move, the Rockefeller story perfectly mirrored that of their fellow oligarchs, the Rothschilds. Whereas the Rothschilds had supplemented their banking fortune with their oil interests, the Rockefellers supplemented their oil fortune with banking interests. Springboarding from success to success as they consolidated monopolies across every field of human activity, the oligarchs' ambitions became even larger. This time, their goal was to consolidate control over the very food supply of the world itself. And once again, they would use philanthropy as the cover for their business takeover. The Green Revolution began in 1943 when plant geneticist Norman Borlaug and a team of researchers arrived on Mexican soil. His goal was to improve agricultural techniques and biotechnological methodologies, which in turn would help alleviate starvation and improve the living quality of developing nations. Creating new genetically modified strains of wheat, rice, maize, and other crops, Borlaug planned to win the battle against world hunger. The hope was that these new crops and farming techniques would rescue third world countries from the brink of starvation. That's exactly what happened. The agricultural innovations brought to the poverty-stricken countries gave the farmers the skills and resources necessary to sustain themselves. 
This triggered a chain of events that would allow these once struggling nations to survive. Agricultural exports soared in quantity and diversity and allowed the countries to become self-sufficient. As the genetically modified crops thrived, farmers were able to use their increased income to purchase newer and superior farming machinery. This increase in revenue made farming easier, more reliable, and more efficient. The Green Revolution led to the modernization of agriculture and has had a profound social, economic, and political impact on the world. The Mexican government turned to the Rockefeller Foundation in their endeavor to nourish Mexico through agriculture. Norman Borlaug, needless to say, was a researcher for the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Green Revolution, for whatever increase in yields it brought about, also created markets for the oligarch's own interest in the petrochemical fertilizer industry and gave rise to the ABCD seed cartel of Archer Daniels Midland, Bunge, Cargill, and Louis Dreyfus. These companies, along with their associated interests in the food packaging and processing industry, formed the core of American agribusiness, a concept developed at Harvard Business School in the 1950s with the help of research conducted by Vasily Leontief for the Rockefeller Foundation. The American agribusiness giants shared a common goal, the transformation of third-world agriculture into a captive market for their goods. From this perspective, the project was a runaway success. By the 1970s, the Rockefeller Standard Oil Network and its cronies in the nitrogen fertilizer industry, including DuPont, Dow Chemical, and Hercules Powder, had broken into markets around the world, markets conveniently forced open for them by the U.S. government itself under President Johnson's Food for Peace program, which mandated the use of petrochemical-dependent agricultural technologies by aid recipients. Unable to afford these new technologies themselves, the impoverished third-world beneficiaries of this revolution relied on loans from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, handled by Rockefeller's own Chase Manhattan Bank, and guaranteed by the U.S. government. The real costs of the Green Revolution, economic, agricultural, and environmental, are seldom tallied. Access to these debt-financed petrochemical-dependent technologies exacerbated the difference between the rich landowning class and the landless peasants in countries like India, where land reform and abolition of usury were dropped from the political agenda after the Green Revolution took over. Even then, the revolution's main success, its increase in agricultural yields, has been oversold. Yield growth across India actually slowed after the introduction of agribusiness. The environmental destruction is even more devastating. An overview in the December 2000 edition of Current Science notes, the Green Revolution has not only increased productivity, but it has also produced several negative ecological consequences, such as depletion of lands, decline in soil fertility, soil salinization, soil erosion, deterioration of environment, health hazards, poor sustainability of agricultural lands, and degradation of biodiversity. Indiscriminate use of pesticides, irrigation, and imbalanced fertilization has threatened sustainability. The Rockefeller Foundation even acknowledges the critiques of the Green Revolution it funded into existence, insisting that current initiatives take into account lessons learned. Even so, the Foundation continues to fund research and write reports on how to improve prospects for agribusiness investment in its target markets. As egregious as the Green Revolution was and continues to be, however, in many ways it was just the prelude to an even more ambitious project, the Gene Revolution. Now the project is not merely to monopolize the technologies, supplies, and chemical inputs for agriculture worldwide, but to monopolize the food supply itself through the replacement of the world's natural seeds with patentable, genetically modified crops. The players involved in this gene revolution are almost identical to the players in the green revolution, with IG Farben offshoots, Bayer Crop Science, and BASF Plant Science mingling with traditional oligarch associate companies like Dow AgroScience, DuPont Biotechnology, and, of course, Monsanto, all funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and fellow philanthropists at the Ford Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and like-minded organizations. The convergence of corporate, philanthropic, governmental, and intergovernmental interests in promoting GM crops around the world can be seen in the bewildering array of research institutes, industry associations, and consultative groups devoted to the case. The Rockefeller-funded International Rice Research Institute, the Rockefeller Monsanto USA Brainchild International Service for the Acquisition of Agrobiotech Applications, the Rockefeller Ford World Bank created Consultative Group of International Agricultural Research, 
and dozens of other bland, benign-sounding organizations research and promote GM crops in target markets around the globe, with the profits ending up in the oligarchs' coffers. A representative example of this story is the agribusiness neocolonization of Argentina, where Monsanto ran an elaborate bait-and-switch to get the country hooked on its genetically modified Roundup-ready soybeans before demanding royalties on the crops that were by then already growing. DuPont then took over, magnanimously beginning a protein-for-life program to foist their own GM soybeans on the country's poor. The same scene has played itself out in country after country, where cartel-developed GM crops are foisted on emerging economies through food aid, usually during times of famine when those countries are especially vulnerable. Only a handful of countries like Zambia or Angola have outright rejected this GMO takeover of their food supply, generously subsidized by the U.S. government to the benefit of the agribusiness cartel.